I'm Mark Gagan and you're listening to the Voice of Insurance podcast, produced in association with Advantage Go, enabling enterprise-scale underwriting through a single pane of glass. Today's guest is Clive Busnell, CEO of Tizers. Tizers is one of the oldest breaking brands at Lloyd's, with a history going back 200 years. But the Tizers of today is the product of a lot of recent M&A activity involving the UK arm of Integro and London wholesaler RFIB, all of which has recently been acquired by Australasian broking group AUB. Clive's background is not as a broker, but as a financial services professional who has spent a career serving the insurance market. He is disarmingly open about this and immediately describes his role as one of an enabler who allows his brokers to be brilliant. And in a market where investment in technology and multi-skilled teams finding new ways of doing business are key to unlocking value, everything that Clive says makes enormous sense. As management and broking are recognised as two separate skills and as brokers become much larger and far more complex entities, far fewer of the brokers of the future are likely to be run by career brokers. But business acumen and technical ability aside, it's Clive's energy that comes across in this podcast. Tizers is a firm that has been through a lot, but with integration complete and an ambitious new owner behind the group, the overriding impression is of an energised business excited to get to grips with new insurance problems. Clive is concise and direct, and that means we cover a large amount of topics and detail in a relatively short time. After a listen you should get a really clear idea of how Tizers will develop as a broker in the coming years. See if you find his enthusiasm as infectious as I did. Enjoy the podcast. This episode is supported by Oxbow Partners. Oxbow Partners is a management consulting business specialising in the London, Bermuda and European insurance and reinsurance markets. In fact, in 2021 and 2022, they were named one of the top 10 consultancies in the sector by the Financial Times. It's fascinating speaking to the team about the kinds of topics they're supporting. Helping reinsurers take a strategic view of their operating models. Designing smart follow syndicates in the Lloyds market. And developing ESG responses. The company's strapline talks about giving executives a fresh perspective. So if you're keen to understand the challenges and opportunities coming down the track for your business, I'd recommend giving the team at Oxbow Partners a call. Clive, welcome to Voice of Insurance. Mark, good to be here. The Tizers that you're running today is a product of quite a lot of M&A activity. So I think it's probably a good idea to set the scene for the listeners to sort of bring us up to date of you know, how the Tizers of today has been created and then where you think it's going to be going now. Absolutely. So, I mean, Tizers is, as you alluded to in the past, a product of a lot of M&A in the last five, six years. It started when it was Integro and then Integro acquired Tizers and that was a coming together of, I guess, a lot of small companies and then a, and then a great traditional company. I mean, Tyres is the oldest brand in Lloyd's, over 200 years old now. So quite an early decision was to consolidate around the Tyres' brand. And then more recently, the acquisition of RFIB, which happened just before lockdown, which had its challenges, I have to say. So the combination of those, Integro, um, Tyres and RFIB, consolidating on the Tyres' brand, which again, I think is very powerful. So we brought that business together now. We're 1,100 people. We've got a retail business, especially retail business, a really strong wholesale and specialty business and a MGA business, which I'll talk about later, is, is growing about 200 million in revenue and a very broad set of products and services. Wow. So was it easy to coalesce around that tires as brand? And was it easy or was it, is it just simply as a matter of making a decision and then people going along with it quickly? Well, I think the brand choice is very easy because I really believe, passionately believe it's, it's one of the strongest brands in the market, come back to the oldest brand and a very good traditional insurance brand. So that was easy. Of course, coalescing the teams around that is a bit more challenging in terms of people had naturally their allegiances to their previous brands and previous organisations. But I think that's more or less done now. I think people have rallied behind the brand and we're proud to be tires in the marketplace. And what sort of style do you bring to the business? What sort of style of leadership? I hope it's genuine for a start. But I think, first of all, I'm not a broker. I've been the last 20 odd years in and around the insurance world, particularly London market, etc. And what I like to try and say to people is I'm here to make our brokers brilliant. I passionately believe that if we've got brilliant brokers who are relentlessly focused on the customer, my job is to make them brilliant. So to make the day to day job easier, to enable them to do great things, etc. So my leadership style almost is I work for my brokers to make them brilliant in terms of what we can do for our customers. That's probably a bit refreshing, is it? Because when you have broker CEOs, then you can remove ego from all of that and sort of having to be the biggest, sometimes old broker firms, it would be that leader probably was the strongest character. Look, I like to think so. And I see it very much as a partnership between me and the broking teams. And I bring a whole lot of skills that they don't. 
and they bring a whole lot of skills that I don't. We try and see it as a partnership. If I'm there relentlessly focused on trying to make the business more efficient, they say, well, hopefully that's a good partnership or out there doing these sort of things, right? I mean, trying to promote the business, et cetera. I just want our brokers to be focused on solutions and products for our customers and I'll worry about running the business day to day. Is this just a reflection of the modern age? Perhaps back in the old days, you had two or three partner firm brokers. Now they've all amalgamated and we're probably boiling down to about 10 much larger, much better resourced brokers in London, independent brokers. Do you think that's just the way of the world that, in fact, it's probably better to be run by a professional manager than run by a broker? I'd like to think so. And again, I have huge respect for Aon and Greg Case, obviously, who wasn't a broker, came in there, has done a fantastic job with Aon. Again, I think, again, a very much a partnership of bringing together different skill sets. You know, you talk about multidisciplinary teams, et cetera. That's how I like to see it. I think the modern way is recognizing that to run a business nowadays, you need lots of different skill sets and bringing those together in the right way is what I'm trying to do here. So you've got a new owner and we're always talking about consolidation in the London market, but it seems to be there's been a particularly big wave recently in the last couple of years. I mean, it always seems to be going on, but we've had a large run of acquisitions and of brokers changing hands. Do you think your change of ownership, is that one of the last pieces in the puzzle in terms of this being a process that's now more or less complete? No, I don't think so. I, look, I think scale is going to always be important and scale will drive efficiency. It'll drive the ability to invest in things like data and analytics, et cetera. So I think the future, you're either going to have to have scale or you have to be super niche. I think that middle market's going to go. I think there's still more consolidation to come to drive scale. And we're going to see more of that, I think, in the next few years. And tell us a bit about AUB, because it's a new name for a lot of people you know, from down under. What sort of owner are they going to be? I think brilliant. And the process went on of our acquisition too long. We all know that. I knew that. My ambition was to get the right new owner for us. And I passionately believe AUB are the right new owner. They're a very powerful broker, the second biggest broker in Australia and New Zealand. They have a very long heritage like we do. They're brilliant at doing retail. They're a brilliant retail broker and network of retail brokers. And the combination for me is very powerful. They also have a relentless focus on the customer. That's very much part of their DNA. And how do we focus on bringing better products and services to the customers and allow AUB to grow and expand by having a really sophisticated central placement capability? So the combination of really good retail broking, then having MGAs providing either niche products or a selection of products focused on an industry or a territory back into a central placing engine that then also thinks about how you look, think about the reinsurance and the retro, that for me is the combination. The reason I got excited, this is not an integration exercise around two marine teams coming together or two retail businesses coming together. It's how do we create a more efficient value chain focused ultimately on the customer. So I presume you're going to be doing a lot more Australian business and New Zealand business than you did before? Well, we're already doing some, but I mean, yeah, you did quite a lot absolutely. before, I'm sure. Every, everybody's got quite a lot of business out and there. And we're really excited about that territory. I think there was an article recently that talked about struggling to place certain business in Australia, we really want to unlock that and say, look, if we do our job well, we will be able to unlock more capacity and more ability to place Australian business into London. This is obviously a part of an internationalization strategy for them. Do you have a sense that they like to become a global broker in some sense, or that they have ambitions to be a retail broker outside of Australia and New Zealand? Well, it's a great question. Absolutely. There's a very ambitious management team there. And obviously, it's one step at a time to a certain extent. But for me, this is the first part of an international strategy that you can see in you know, Australia and New Zealand. We want to maximize our UK retail business into that. And you can see other territories coming on board. I very much see the US as we're not going to look at own distribution. That's very much about working with our current partners, et cetera, in the US. So other territories outside the US, absolutely, as part of an international strategy. Obviously, while this process was going on, it did drag on a bit. You mentioned about the integration. Is it all complete now in terms of those three main pillars, the three largest constituent parts of Tizers? Is that all really over now? I might be the wrong person to ask. I would say yes, because I mean, from the CEO's point of view, I see us as one organization. I'm sure as you go down into the organization, you're still going to find more pockets of people who are still walking with an RFIB notepad or an Integro badge or something. But generally, I think that's largely over. We've still got some more work to do on the operations side, although we made a lot of progress in the last year on integrating IT systems, and we're all on common Teams platforms, et cetera. So we can operate very much as one business. And a major part of the last 18 months has been investing in infrastructure, which means we can be one tires, we can generally work anywhere. It doesn't matter where you pitch down. We've got no dependency on a physical location anymore. So that flexibility and that brand, I think it means that we've come together as one organization. But there's bound to be pockets in the organization that say we're still not one organization. That will be the case. Is it better now that people can come back to the office to actually start to sit people closer to each other and realize that they're all perfectly normal? Yeah, look, I'm a big fan still of face-to-face. 
we've got this sort of surge on a Wednesday where there's a real buzz in the office and, and it's great. Equally, when we had the train strike the other week, we didn't miss a beat because people just said, oh, we'll work from home that day. So we've got flexibility, but I'm a great fan of face-to-face. I want to encourage more people coming back more often. I'm a huge fan of the city and Lloyd's, and I think we must have more face-to-face, but with the flexibility of working from anywhere. Perhaps the secret weapon of the CEO in, in this discussion is, is aircon, because actually in the UK, most people don't have aircon at home. So I think actually I must go into the office because they've got aircon there. <laughs> <laughs> or it's a nice day to cycle in or something, or those alternative commutes to work. But, you know, I, I think flexibility is the word going forward. I mean, some people have found they like getting up, working early and then coming in later on in the day, for example. So we want to encourage flexibility. But I really feel, particularly in our world, there's a real advantage of some of those face-to-face interactions. You're seeing it now, not only face-to-face in London, but traveling again. You know, we're encouraging a lot of travel and we're already seeing that there's real benefit for the customer. Teams are traveling that didn't travel before. So we're thinking about different products we can start to bring together. So more face-to-face, more travel and all underpinned by flexibility. It's still huge, and we're still in this recovery phase, and I must say, I was walking along Fenchurch Street, and I bump into people, and if you haven't seen them for two years, they do come up and shake your hand, and they wouldn't have shaken my hand two years ago, because, you know, we'd have taken that for granted, the fact they just hadn't physically seen each other. But shaking hands is nice again, isn't it? It I was mean, really you, nice. It was a hesitation a few months ago, now you're back into the natural. I mean, we had our 200-year party a few weeks ago, which was two years late, because it should have been two years ago, but obviously, for obvious reasons, it wasn't. And there was like 500 people there, a lot of the markets, and there was a real buzz. And the amount of people that wrote to me afterwards or commented say it was lovely to get back together again, you know, have one of those events where we had a chance for a lot of people to get together and how much they've missed those sort of things. So you've got this new owner, got fighting fit in London and with a decent size business that can go toe to toe with probably anybody. Now that you're becoming a global business because you've got an Australasian owner, are there any plans to then say, right, open up in different hubs? other wholesale hubs around the world that do exist? Or is it a real London focus? I think the focus will be on how do we make the best place and solution for our customers. And we already use the hubs around the world. It's not just London, Lloyd's and and the London market. We already have that. But in terms of what we're going to do, I think that's still work in progress, to be honest, Mark. I mean, the thing I would say is fundamental to our business is we need to be brilliant at three things. We need to be really good at expertise. And I think going forward, more and more, the amount of expertise we can add value to the customer. It's not just what's in people's mind or their knowledge of the customer directly or their relationship skills. It's broader. So how does data analytics play into that? How does much more broader macroeconomic structures? I talked about how to really understand industry. So expertise is going to be fundamental. The other one, and we'll probably come on to this, is efficiency. How do we really get more efficient at what we do? This, This is not an efficient industry. And I think part of the link up going from retail through MGAs into wholesale, how do we make that whole thing? And we place over 850 binders. You know, how do we make that a really efficient process, which is not today? So the second E of my three E's is efficiency and being brilliant at that. And technology will be a major part of that technology and data, in fact, very much aligned to Lloyd's blueprint too, is if you can join the dots and you can get consistent data through the chain, then you can start driving efficiency. And that'll come back into the expertise thing because you'll have more data to then process into analytics, et cetera. The third one I should probably get most excited about is E for energy and maintaining a really energetic culture. You know, I want to make sure that when people come in this business, it's a great place to work. They feel inspired to go out and find new business. They feel inspired to provide new and innovative solutions to our customers every day. So if we can be really good experts, high efficiency and have a highly energetic culture, we will win into the future. So it's sort of excitement, I suppose, is the other E with energy there. You want people to be an enthusiasm, I suppose. Well, if you could do an overlaying E, then it would be excitement. Yes. So it's excitement overlaying those three. Absolutely. So it's just keeping people motivated. By the way, you mentioned before about MGAs, and I suppose a lot of brokers have had a much more obvious triangular structure. We've got the holding company, you've got the broken company, you've got an MGA company that is quite visible. I haven't seen that as a Tizer's structure, but you mentioned about MGAs being a big part of the distribution picture going on. So can you sort of enlighten me on what's your MGA strategy going forward? We have got MGAs internally. Yeah, I assumed you had them, but they're not as visible. No, they're not. You're right. And we've been building them. We've built a really good trucking MGA called Atento in the last year. We've got two or three more in the pipeline. It'll be a fundamental pillar of our business going forward. And I think, again, those MGAs are going to be either highly specialized around products such as the trucking one or a marine cargo MGA or a sports and entertainment MGA, or they're going to start focusing on territories and industry where you say, look, this industry, so maybe the hotel industry requires a whole series of products. Why don't we structure that into an MGA where we're providing those sort of products? So absolutely, it's going to be a pillar going forward. And we're going to run it more as a discrete entity. And we're going to put more effort and investment strategy into our MGA pillar. So if you take the professional services industry, for example, they've always focused on industry. 
And I think the insurance world will more and more start to focus on industry. And we want to be thinking about what are the range of products that you can bring to that industry that makes sense because you've thought about it in advance, you've joined the dots for them, and you start to take a range of products to an industry. And I suppose when you're looking as a professional manager of this business, you're looking at the journeys that different types of risk can go on when they come through your business and presume you want to get them quickly down the path of least resistance first. So I presume all the small premium, small limit type business, you'd like that to be done in the most efficient manner possible, straight to the MGA or straight to Binder. Facilitization, again, will be a key thing. But again, it comes back to the efficiency point. You want to be doing that in an efficient way. We've got scale in binders, et cetera, where we want to make that a really efficient pipe almost from retail right through to central placement. You did mention before about reinsurance and retro. The reinsurance broking world has been a bit like one of those souvenir snowstorms that people have on their mantelpieces, but someone's given it a hell of a shake in the last three years. And slowly, perhaps all those little flakes are circulating, they're starting to settle. For many, that's been seen as an opportunity. Many independent brokers have said, right, this is my chance to go and see if I can get a piece of that pie, that reinsurance pie, and made some big investments. Do you think of it in that way, that there's an opportunity for reinsurance broking for Tizers? There is. But let me be clear, I don't think at this point we're going to compete and be a generalist reinsurance broker. I mean, that, that's real scale, real expertise, data analysts, et cetera. Where we will be reinsurance is where we're linked to an offering, where we've got real expertise, and therefore we're placing the reinsurance in that sense. So treaty reinsurance marine, for example, it's where we've got real expertise in an area, and we're doing that as part of our offering. For some of the lines, you're particularly well-known, obviously, in the P&I, and obviously in sports and entertainment. So yeah. someone or said, we've got a particular market, right, that wants us to work with them. We've got a long-standing relationship, and therefore we're doing it. So I think it will be linked to reinsurance rather than broad reinsurance. Well, I suppose also where you can apply some of the data in some of those very specialist classes, and you can say, well, you know more about it than anybody else. Exactly. So, for example, let's talk a bit about innovation in marine. Our marine team here are the most innovative team, and they're always up for saying, how can we do more? And we're working now on a product where we're looking at war and ships going into a war zone and having instant tracking of those ships. So you, we know they're in the zone, data feedback straight away, so the endorsements and stuff can be done automatically in real time. So you can imagine the old system was quite slow. Now we're saying this is real-time understanding of where those ships are going, real-time endorsements, but then that feeds data back then to the ship owners. So then you start saying in that area, not only are we going to create efficiency, and efficiency can be much more efficient in terms of time and cost, but also the data that starts to reveal that you can then feed back in a really value-added way. Then you can start to say, given all that, of course we're in the reinsurance game in that area because we've got all the data, we've got all the understanding. It's been a great paradox that the Marine has been one of the earliest adopters of a lot of the insured tech. No, it's brilliant. And there's so many opportunities in Marine. If you think about all the ships that are going around the world, all the information that actually can be gleaned from that in terms of where they go, the cargoes they're... they're I mean, they know what's in every container and what's happening to it, more or less. They know a lot more about it. So it seems odd that the insurers don't know. But we're right at the forefront of that. This war was a really interesting area because ships go in and out of war zones regularly. And what we're saying, we will now understand that real time. And we'll turn that into real-time endorsements and feedback what that's costing and even give people pre what you're about to go into a war zone type thing. So that's a really interesting development, I think, for the Marine team. And talking something specific, obviously something that ties us is really well known for, that entertainment and sport division. Yeah. How's that faring after COVID? And what's that market like? First of all, during COVID, we were still incredibly busy because we were working a lot of claims. And we took a decision, which I'm very proud of, to keep the whole team together. So we didn't make anyone redundant. We kept the team together. Because we knew it would come back. Because the musicians, they have to tour, they love to tour. So it's part of it. So as soon as the venue started to open up, et cetera, that business is coming back really strongly. I mean, it's constrained a little bit by venues and, and the ability to actually get the capacity to tour because everyone now wants to do it. But we're right at the forefront of that. You know, we did a lot of work lobbying the government in terms of that area as well and ties at the forefront of that. And that business is coming back stronger than it ever was. And I'm really proud of the team there and what they've done. So they worked really hard during COVID on claims and now they're working really hard on placing that business. What about future communicable diseases, obviously, because we had this discussion 15 years ago with SARS, and it was excluded, and then you could write it back over time. Where are we now in that? I don't know how it's going to land, Mark. I wish I did. But at the moment, it's landed in a position where people are comfortable with the exclusions and then businesses being placed. But we, of course, this is, this is a lot of the non-appearance stuff we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, there's here. tons of reasons. Obviously, the weather and people getting sore throats and, and yeah, exactly. things. Yeah, there's a, lot, there's a lot of things other than mass communicable diseases. Yeah. And obviously, terrorism, uh, yeah. you know, all sorts of horrible things can happen. But the market's just happy to be back. 
Yeah, look, my impression, absolutely. I mean, you know, still some capacity challenges in terms of that, but we're doing a good job placing that business. But the overwhelming thing is the public want tours to happen because, you know, we want a feel-good factor. We want to go to these things and then these fantastic events. The artists want to tour, so we're just making sure we can enable those things to happen. And sometimes with the broker's job, when the market hasn't got the capacity, obviously we've had a lot of exits, haven't we? But then we've had a few people coming back in. It's to go and form some of that capacity or help form that capacity. Do you ever see that as your job? being known as a global leader in that class. Undoubtedly, and trying to promote, like, like much the way we did with the government, you know, we were at the forefront of the lobbying because we understand that really well. We've got the support of the artists to do that. And so part of our job, that comes back to the expertise thing, part of our job is not directly about serving an individual customer, it's about the industry and how do we think about how we can best serve the industry in terms of finding capacity or lobbying the government for certain things. All of that, I think, is absolutely part of our job. It's good to have a professional manager on the show because often when I get at someone who's a career broker, and I asked them about technology, we'd say, well, you know, I'd rather not, or I'd rather defer to somebody else. But with you, obviously, your focus on efficiency, I'd love to get your take on how you've engaged with this whole insure tech phenomenon that's really developed over the last six, seven years now, and how you want to ingest some of that into Tizers. Or maybe you don't. Look, I think insure tech's very important, but at the heart of it, it's how do we create solutions which join up end to end are much more efficient and have data at the core. And that's no different from Blueprint 2 at Lloyd's, right? And what they're trying to do in that thinking. And what we're engaging is we have a new platform internally called T-Connect, which is Tizer's connectivity. And basically what it's saying is we need to connect the value chain end to end. And so we need to find solutions that connect to our clients and solutions that connect to our markets, make sure we're well connected internally. And we, we like, I'm sure most of our competitors, we still do far too much rekeying and all those sort of things. So for me, InsureTech is about enabling efficiency and about creating new ways of doing business. So I like the conversation about the war solution. For me, that's an internal insure tech program, is, is how do we change the game? How do we do things differently? I'm very excited about the whole insure tech world. Brokers will look more like professional service companies and technology companies in five to 10 years than they do now, inevitably, in my view. It doesn't mean we lose the core skill of broker. You know, technology will be more at the heart, and professional advice will be more at the heart. So it'll be more balanced between those three things than we're seeing today. Do you think a positive byproduct of some of this consolidation that we've had that where we've distilled 200 brokers down to probably 10 big groups within London, say the independent groups, is that whereas in the old days, they've had four partners and they'd be a specialist in one particular class and certainly not a specialist in technology, having the heft, you've all got your own chief information officers and that kind of thing and more resource to invest in some of that expertise. Does that bode well for the future? Yeah, and look, again, you come back to AUB. I mean, they've got a whole technology division. They run networks, they provide services to networks, etc. And we are going to go more in that direction. So some of the products we're developing internally, we may externalize and, and create genuine product that we're putting out there as a technology product to support others using it. And so it's not just about scale. It's, it's actually starting to think about having almost your own internal tech company that's servicing the business. And I think that comes with scale, it comes with expertise, and to attract the right sort of people into the business in that area, we're going to have to say, look, we really are serious about technology and what it can do and how it can create new innovative solutions. So you would sell that to competitors even, perhaps? Potentially, yeah. Or even people within a network. So if we're part of a network, we say part of our job is to serve that network with better technology. And that's certainly what AUB do very well in, in Australia. We would look to do that more here. We'd look at the marine network and we'd say, you know, the carriers and the other brokers, etc. if we can enable that all to happen more efficiently, we want to do that. It's really, really interesting. What do you make of algorithmic underwriting, automatic underwriting on the carrier side? How should a broker react to that? I presume you have to become algorithmic brokers. What I say is connected brokers. Isn't your job then to at least reverse engineer their algorithm and be able to <laughs> divert it to get the best price? As always, Mark, you get to challenging questions. I mean, I see how very much our role is in, as a broker, is in, come back to being efficient, so it's connectivity and good data and then turning that into expertise. Now, that expertise results in us becoming also our version of algorithms. I think maybe on the reinsurance side, but not specialists, we would think about how do we have data and ideas and potentially things, but trying to sort of second guess algorithm underwriting, I don't think is where we're going to be. I suppose a broke in the end, you know, we can codify the things that we tend to do, the habits that we have, and then the habits change, of course, as the market changes, but it might be sort of, if not this leader A quoting, then it will be leader B, and then if not B, then C, and then if not C, then probably nobody will have to get back to the client saying no one actually really wants to do this. <laughs> and you could codify some of that, couldn't you? Yeah, but think about your question again, where do we really add value? Again, coming back to the claims process. I'll come back to the contingency team in the event that all these events were being cancelled. I mean, we were really adding value to that process and making sure that we were the party working on behalf of the customer 
to make sure the right outcome was, was achieved. So in that scenario, it might be algorithmically written, but when something happens, you still need to be on top of that for the customer in terms of claims and outcomes, et cetera. And what value can technology add to that process? And how much do you think you can automate some of that? The claims process? I suppose if it's parametric, you can. Parametric is another very interesting, and we were right at the forefront of developing a parametric product, funnily enough, for the Northern Territories of Australia for farmers, when, you know, it's just basically simply if the wind blows above a certain level, because they were struggling to get a product, struggling for capacity, and there's been some innovation there in conjunction with Lloyd's to develop a parametric product. Again, I think that, again, is a big part of the future in terms of the way we think about insurance and the parametric products. How optimistic are you about all the blueprints and all the London market reforms about the chances of them really advancing today? Change in this marketplace is always difficult. We know that. I was in many years running exchanging, as you know, and trying to drive change. I mean, change does happen, but I think we probably overestimate it in the short term and underestimate it in the long term. And I'm completely on board with the vision of what Blueprint 2 is trying to do. And it comes back to this. If we can fundamentally enable a more data-driven, efficient, connected marketplace, that will add value to the customers and the participants. But it's going to take time because we have so many different ways of doing things still in the marketplace and codifying what we do into data is challenging. I mean, the core data record, I think that Lloyd's have achieved is a huge breakthrough. Now we need to work out how do we operationalize that. Part of the gain is in the efficiency, but the real gain is then using that data ultimately to enable faster processes, better processes, more insightful processes, et cetera. Excellent. So there's a consultation out on the, I don't know what the I stands for in the I market reform contract probably internet or something like that. Or probably, yes. Intelligent, intelligent. I, I must intelligent. go and look. I'll put it in the notes. It's the intelligent the MRC, which means it's builds intelligence into the contract, so computable contracts, et cetera. We want a market that doesn't do validation, et cetera. We want a market that's got an irrefutable data record. So when it starts with a piece of data, that's irrefutable throughout the process. So I'm not second-guessing the markets. The markets aren't second-guessing me. When a technical account's created, we all trust that it's right. Once that's there, we can then concentrate on the more value-added activities. So my answer to the question is, I'm optimistic that the vision is right, but it's going to still take a long time. We've all got to put a lot of effort in to drive it. Because some of these fruit may actually be low-hanging, but they still come from to be firmly attached to the Well, tree. that's right. They're low-hanging, but they're, they're attached strongly. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Clive, I've really enjoyed chatting to you. You're very concise. I think we've got through a lot more than I would have expected. So that's very efficient of you. Plays into one of the, one of the E's, so three E's. Well, and, and obviously energetic because you did it fast enough. So I really appreciate your time. It sounds like you've got an awful lot to be getting on with. And I wish you all the best with that. And I hope you come talk to us soon about it. Mark, always enjoying talking to you. Thanks very much. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, don't forget to subscribe or leave a like or a review or recommendation on whatever podcast platform you used to access this programme. These really help get the word out. Before we go, just a quick reminder that advertising slots are available here and in other places in the Voice of Insurance podcasts. Podcasting is the fastest growing medium and attracts a high quality audience of key decision makers. It's also an intimate medium where you, the listener, are right in the room with me and the interview subjects. Needless to say, that means it's a great way of getting your message out directly to an audience because you know you've got their full attention. It's also very cost effective. So get in touch with Mark at thevoiceofinsurance.com to find out how you could be speaking directly to the industry. The Voice of Insurance podcast is produced in association with Advantage Go, enabling enterprise-scale underwriting through a single pane of glass. Voice of Insurance is produced by me, Mark Gagan. Music was written by Anna Gagan and produced by Carlos Gagan. Check out more podcasts and written comment pieces at www.thevoiceofinsurance.com.